Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live. Today, we have with us writer-director Eduardo Rodriguez. Eduardo, thank you for being on our show. How are you doing tonight? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on the show. I really our, appreciate it. It's our pleasure. Uh, I saw your newest movie coming that came out, The Darkness of the Road. Uh, you said it was released a couple of days ago. We'll get to that in a minute. And uh, right. we were just talking on how brilliant and unique of a script this is uh i want to i want to ask you it is so difficult nowadays to come up with something new uh, in hollywood where everything has been done and people are trying to find new ways to narrate stories so when you were writing this script what was your biggest influence and what inspired you to make it different from something people have seen before on their screens Inspiration. I'm. Mean, I'm a big fan of all. I grew up with all the '70s horror movies. Uh, Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, The Omen, uh, The Shining. I, I grew up with all those movies, so I'm sure there's a lot of uh, inspiration and uh, and influences from from those movies on on, on all of my movies. Um, when I was when I actually wrote uh, Darkness of the Road, it wasn't so much that I wanted to try something different. It is based on a short film that uh, that I also wrote and directed uh, 20 years ago, back in 2001. I went to to Florida State uh, FSU in Tallahassee, uh -huh. and uh, that was my thesis film back back in 2001. And it was the, the same premise. Mom wakes up in the middle of the night and her little girl is gone and she freaks out and she starts uh, searching for her. But that was only a 15, a 15 minute long short. And, um, and I wanted to explore more. I wanted to get to know her more, why she did what she did, how she faced uh, the consequences of, of what she did. So I just wanted to explore more more of that idea, and so based on that on that short film, I wrote the feature version. Very nice. Now you have a going back to the early two thousands. Uh, you know, this is what's written. Verify if this is true or not. But back in two thousand and two, <laughs> the head of Dimensions Films at that time offered you a three picture deal which got you listed on Entertainment Weekly's 2002 It list. Uh, it, first of all, is that true? And if it is, what was that like? <laughs> it is true. Uh, a lot of partying, a lot of uh, um, fun stuff. It was a little surreal. I never actually believed it that much because I was just coming out of film, film school. Uh, my plan was, again, I was back in Tallahassee, uh, so my plan was finish film, film school, come to L.A. because I wanted to make movies and uh, be a PA in some movies, write some scripts. I never imagined that I was going to get a three picture deal out of anybody. That not is not so even rare. one picture deal, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so so to me, it was always like one of those stories that you read about, but it doesn't happen to you. And that's how kind of like the way I always took it is like. This is like some Hollywood fantasy thing, so I'm I'm just gonna continue with what I want to do, which is making movies. You know, so exactly. I never really bought too much into it, and and it, and it, it was such a weird thing because I got the three picture deal, but then as I was finishing my first movie, I don't know you if you remember, but back in 2002, uh, the Weinstein's got booed out of of yeah. Miramax and Dimension mm -hmm. Films, and the whole thing fell apart. We yeah. were doing post-production on my first movie, uh, which was called Curandero, back in Mexico City, and we heard the news. Oh, Miramax is gone. Yeah. The wine scenes are gone. Uh, so there was no three-picture deal anymore. There was not even a studio yeah. to, <laughs> to make any more movies. That's typical of this industry. One day, you know, it could be here, and then the next day it can be here. It changes. It's very fluid. Uh, I tell everybody, nothing is guaranteed in the mm -hmm. entertainment industry. Absolutely nothing. Now, looking at your body of work, uh, you can tell you are a big horror lover, a big horror fan. All your work consists in the horror genre. 
how far back does that go for you know for you was it always from childhood that you had this love for horror yeah abs absolutely i grew up more with with horror novels my, my first uh horror book was uh, Stephen King's uh, Cujo oh. um, and that scared and there's nothing supernatural about that that story but that scared a lot of me and I think that something something hit me when when you were like where a dog can be that scary mm -hmm. you know mom trapping a car with a little girl uh, and just a dog outside that car can be that scary that I don't somehow it something click in my head that I was like, this is what I want to do. Uh, and like I said, then I started, I, I, I was really, I didn't watch that many horror movies when I was a kid because I was really scared. Like, I remember I saw uh, Jaws um, and my mom was like, don't watch it, don't watch it. And, and I was like, I don't care, I'm going to watch it. So I watched it anyway. And it was like a week that I couldn't sleep. Every night I will wake up with nightmares. Yeah. So I, I, I avoided horror movies. Uh, as much as I, as I could when I was a kid. Now you ha you hail from Venezuela. Uh, how much of an influence, you know, coming from Venezuela, plays into your writing and directing? Um, probably quite a bit. I mean, I spent twenty twenty something years of my life uh, in Venezuela. Um, so I'm sure growing up there. Um, and completely different culture, um, it, it it made a, a, a big impact on how I see the world and how I approach movies, for sure. But I grew up with American movies, so and that's always been the love of my life. So, uh, so I'm sure that there's a balance there. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, you had this love of horror. You come to the United States. Uh, you said after 20 years. You go to school in Florida, and you knew that you wanted to be in films, correct? You wanted to make films. You had no doubt about that whatsoever, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, so what was the journey like? You, you were talking about your thesis from actually finishing school, and then you got this deal with Miramax, and you just said Miramax a year later fell apart. Um do you think it was that short that you made as your thesis, which is, you know, became the feature film, uh, The Darkness of the Road? Would you say that has been the biggest pivot point in your career so far? By far. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that short film exploded for whatever reason. I don't think it's that good, but that short film when everywhere he got nominated to Cannes, he won like 20 festivals. It was crazy. It was a crazy adventure uh, with daughter. That's the, that's the, that's the name of uh, the title of the short film. So definitely that that's how my career started, uh, thanks to that short film. In the feature, you do a brilliant job of keeping the audience guessing what is real, what is not real. I know when I was watching it, uh, several times throughout the film, I'm like, okay, she's dead. And she's a, she's a ghost, and she doesn't know it. <laughs> you know, and then I would go another way, and then it would bring me back. I would, I, I, you, you kept us guessing, and for a person like me who's been watching horror films his entire life, it's not very easy to do. I can usually kind of figure it out, but you really kept us guessing. Um, did you have that all preset? It's different when you're sitting and you're writing the script. When you finally got on set and you got behind the camera. Did you find that you had to make a lot of adjustments uh, to bring what you had written down to real to life on camera? Yeah, for sure. But I think not only with Darkness of the Road, every movie, in my experience, is always a struggle between what you have on the pages and what you can in, in the translation to to images. Uh, budget wise, time wise, special effects wise, there's always Something what you have in your head is never what you can put on the screen, no. uh, and there's that that struggle uh, and that balance. And I think making movies is achieving that balance between what your imagination is telling you to do and what the reality it is, because you're running out of time and because you don't have enough money to do the visual effects that you want or whatever limitations you have. 
and uh, and I think that's part of of the of the excitement of making movies is figuring it out as you go. Um, how can I make this the dream that I had? Uh, yeah, you know. Now, you know, we know it was a short. Did you know that at some point in your career you wanted to make this into a full feature film? No. No, it was more of, it just, after I made this short film, probably because it did so well, it kept, it was with me all the time. I, I didn't write the, the feature until 10, ten years later. Um, so it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to make this short because I want to do the feature version of it. I just wanted to make the short based on that idea. And um, and then you kind of like it's, it stuck with me throughout the years. And at some point I was like, well, I got to put this on paper, otherwise it's going to drive me crazy. So I started writing the, the feature version. So you finished the the writing part of the feature sometime around 2011, 2012. Uh, did you try pitching it right away to get yeah. financing? It just took a really long time to find somebody to back it? <laughs> Ten years in the making, yes, sir. Uh, actually, I had a couple of producers... Uh, really good friends of mine, Chris and Luis, were the original producers attached to Darkness of the Road uh, back, as you said, in two, 2010, 2011. And uh, we went everywhere. We pitched it everywhere. We tried to get uh, the money for it. And and they worked their asses off. But uh, it never came together for whatever reason, um, whatever problems we had he, he never came together we actually ended up making another movie together uh called you're not alone yeah uh because we 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 worked together so well trying to put darkness together that after that was over we were like we got to make a movie together um and we ended up making another movie mm -hmm. that you stated that you were not you were surprised by how popular the short was uh, did you feel the same way about the feature? Did that surprise you? Because it's getting rave reviews all around. People love the feature film. When oh, you look, thank you. When you look at the finished product, the film, uh, you you know, you know mentioned earlier in this conversation that you don't know why the short became so popular and not why so many people loved it. Do you feel the same way about the movie? The full movie? The movie hasn't been out there for for that long to, for at least for me to know what the reaction is going to be. But just to give you an example, the first test screening that we had of, of the movie, it was probably 12, 15 people on that, on that uh, theater. Every single one of them hated it, like hated it with passion. Like, why do you make this movie? Uh, um, wow. There was a guy who was like, oh, you like torturing your audience. And I'm like, no, man, I'm just doing this for entertaining. I don't, don't want to torture nobody. Uh, uh, there was a guy who was like, they take all the horror out of it and just make it a drama. They, they, nobody in that, in that audience liked wow, the Wow, that movie. really surprises me. <laughs> and, uh, and that put things on, in perspective, you know. Um, of course, that was just a test audience. And to the producer's credits, they didn't freak out because I remember that the, the editor was sitting there with me and we were looking at each other. It's like, oh, dude, we're in trouble. <laughs> you know, they're going to dismantle the movie uh, if they follow whatever this this, uh, this audience is saying. But to the producer's credits, they, they believed in the movie. They believed in the story and uh, they stuck with it. And uh, we made some changes. We're, we weren't completely deaf. Okay. to what they were saying but uh but it wasn't like oh my god this movie sucks we gotta re shoot it or redo it or anything you know okay. so uh, so okay. now at the end of the day what nobody a hundred percent of the people are not gonna love a movie a hundred percent of the people are not gonna hate a movie all right mm -hmm. at yep. the end of the day you as a filmmaker have to like and be proud of what you did when it comes to the full feature of the darkness of the road now that it's done you've seen it are you happy with what you put out there? Yeah, some parts of it I'm happy. Some parts of it I wish like, oh, we, I wish we had more time. I wish we had more money. I'm my worst uh, critic probably. That's why I tell you, like, I, I'm not sure why people love the short so much because I watch it. I'm like, and it, you start seeing 
all the mistakes you made and all the stuff that you wish you would have done otherwise. So I'm probably the, the worst person to ask if if my movie is, is good or not because you, you never watch it as a full story. You just yeah. watch it as these pieces that you were putting together and shooting and all the problems and all the issues that you had to go through when you when you when you were making it come to your mind like right away. When it came to the writing part, uh, was it always your intention? Uh, and I love this about films, where the filmmakers don't hand us the whole story on a platter and you walk us through every step. You leave stuff up open to interpretation. And there's a lot of that in the darkness of the road. Was that always your intention to leave uh, parts of the movie up to the audience and their interpretation of what's going on in the story? Yeah. I love those kind of movies. Uh, the ones that don't try to force you to feel one way or to think uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a straight path. And I try to, as much as I can, especially when I'm writing uh, my, own, my own stories, to not give everything to the audience. Because I think, to me, that's kind of boring. Like, don't tell me how I should feel. Don't tell me how was was exactly what's going on here. Let me uh, come to my own conclusions. And uh, and I think that's a game uh, that you play with the audience. And, and, and sometimes it goes in, in ways that you never even expected and are better than any of the ideas that you could have ever had. So yeah, I think yeah. that's a good thing, you know. Now, the film centers around two main characters, and that's Siri and Iris, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, for me... With Siri, we sort of know that something is definitely not right with her. Something, we don't know what, uh, but something's not right. For me, the more fascinating character is Iris, okay? Because she pops out of nowhere, and me as the audience, I'm like, well, where did this woman come from? They're in the middle of nowhere, and they meet up at this convenience store, and she hitches a ride with Siri, and then all this weird, crazy stuff uh, starts to happen. When it came to the car, who, when it came to writing the feature film, uh, which of those two characters uh, gave you the biggest? I don't want to say problems, but were was more difficult to formulate. Was it Siri or the character of Iris? I think it was, to me, when I was writing, it was a little bit of both. Uh, the reason why, I, the practical reason why Iris exists is because I couldn't figure out how am I going to make a movie with just one person. Who is she going to talk to? I can give her like a volleyball, like Tom Hanks. <laughs> and Castaway, yeah. It will look weird, uh, yeah. Uh, so so the short film, there, there's no iris in, in the short film. And that, so the practical reason was I need to give her a companion so she can um, express her ideas, her concerns, all this stuff that's going on through her mind. Uh, and then as I started writing it, new ideas, I don't want to get, spoil anything, but new ideas uh, came to my mind of how I can integrate these two characters and make them work in, in, in a in a different way. So I think it was a balance of sometimes Siri was, especially because Siri's journey is such a big drama, is, is a tragedy, what she goes through. So she has so much weight throughout the story and what's happening to her. But Iris also was, was a tricky was tricky business because I had to find ways to, to make her interact with, with Siri and make, and make it flow and, and, and feel natural. Now, the two actresses, N Najara and Leah, they were fabulous. Um, did it take you a while to find the right uh, women to play Siri and Iris? Uh, did you go through a, a prolonged casting period, or did you get really lucky with those two? We got really lucky with both. Um, we, did, we did auditions uh, on both uh, sides, but... Uh, we, it wasn't a long, I think our longest audition was for the little girl. Because oh. that was the hardest uh, part to cast uh, with Winneth. Uh, and we, I get, we lucked out with her too, because she, she was amazing. And, and uh, 
And I always tell this story, her, her parents were even more amazing because sometimes, and you probably know this, when you work with kids, uh, the parents can become their own horror movie, their own horror story, become a nightmare. Yeah, I've got three uh, of my own, so yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so on set, it can be, it, that can be trouble. Um, and, uh, and her parents were super cool. They understood what we wanted to do. They understood it was going to be all nice shoot. And uh, they were super co cooperative. And that made my life and everybody but everybody uh, else's life easier on set. Uh, but going back to Najara and, and Leah, um, Najara had worked before with uh, with one of the producers. So he suggested her. Uh, but she we auditioned her uh just the same, and she blew our our minds uh, during the audition. Like she, one of the scenes that she read for was uh, when she's in the car um, and the little girl is yeah. uh, is there with, with Iris, mm -hmm. and uh, and her performance was flawless. At that point, when I saw that, I was like, I this we don't have to look any any further. Um, this is our Siri. Um, and it was a hard scene to pull off on a, on an audition where you're just in an office yeah. with nothing to react to, just sitting in a chair and a bunch of a bunch of people watching you, you know. And, they, and she they nailed it, both of them. They were yeah. great. They were fantastic. Uh, I mean, you got really, I mean, that was awesome picks for both of those two. Characters. I agree. They, they are what makes, well, they are a big part of what makes the film uh, works. Would you say at the core of the story, it's just a fundamental, the relationship between mother and child. Would you say that is what the, the message you are trying to convey at the core of this film? Yeah, absolutely. And the sacrifices uh, that you make as a parent uh, and all the decisions sometimes, sometimes right, sometimes wrong that you make uh, for your kids, you know, because yeah. that's number one at the top of your list. Uh, your children and uh, absolutely that was when struggle. that baby comes into the world I know I can speak I can speak for myself as a parent you stop living for yourself and you start living for your child so absolutely I, so parents could definitely relate with what's going on with Siri and her child in the film now when it comes to you personally uh, writing and directing if you had to pick which of the two w would you say is where your true passion lies is it with writing is it with directing or is it an equal both no directing for sure uh, I'm, i don't even call myself a writer i don't have i don't have the the discipline to sit every day which a writer has to do you know sit every day in front of a computer and write one page two pages three pages whatever i don't have that 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 discipline and uh and it's, it, it's a struggle, actually, for me to write, to sit there and put all those words and, and slowly build the script and the story and see other characters. So uh, so I only write when I can't contain the story within myself any longer. Then I'm like, I know I got to write this. Otherwise, like I, I told you before, I'm going to go nuts. Uh, otherwise, I just pass. It's like, OK, this is a cool idea. I'll just write down the, the idea, but don't get into the whole script thing. So I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm a writer. I, I'm a, definitely a director. A director. So in all the film that you've directed so far, uh, which one, which project of yours are you most proud of? Uh oh, uh, <laughs> none of them, as I tell you. I'm, oh man, I'm you a, are I'm really critical. Critic. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you which one was the most fun. Okay. Uh, there, I, and that wasn't even a full film. I only did five scenes. It was all the horror set pieces uh, for a movie called The Messengers, which was uh, produced by, by Sam Raimi. Uh, and uh, it was directed by a couple of um, directors, the Pang Brothers. And I don't know exactly the details, but the studio didn't get along with them and they didn't get along with the studio. Uh, so they fired him, and they were looking for a director to to the reshoots and all the horror pieces because they weren't working mm -hmm. in the movie. And uh, and Sam Raimi saw my short film, and he liked it again. 
I don't know why, but he, he really liked it. And he hired me on the spot. It was that's the easiest job I've ever gotten. Uh, he only the only question he asked me was like, "Do you storyboard?" And I was like, "Yeah, sometimes I do storyboards. Like for for daughter for the show films, we we storyboard a couple of scenes." And he, he he looked at me for like a second, and he was like, "Okay, cool. So you start tomorrow, uh, and uh, this is what we want you to do." And that was it. Like I got the job just by saying that I like to storyboard. Maybe if I would have said, "No, I, I hate storyboarding," I would have never made. It. What was it like? Uh, I mean, Sam Raimi. That's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big name in not just horror, but you know, movies in general. Uh, Sam Raimi is not exclusive to horror, although. Some of his best films are in the horror genre. What was your experience with uh, with Sam Raimi? Oh, amazing. That's what I was telling you. That that's the most fun I ever had. And I said, and I was, the, I was a new kid on the block because they already shot the movie. So everybody knew each other, the DP. It wasn't my DP. It was, it was a whole crew that they already had in place. And I was going to go there and be like, hey, guys, I'm here. I don't know. They put me here and I'm supposed to to tell you what to do. Uh, so I was super scared, uh, but everybody, we shot in Canada and in, in Saskatchewan, and everybody was super cool, super welcome. Sam Raimi, what, he really wanted to make that movie the best movie he, he could make, and uh, even though he was he was a producer. Um, and uh, it, it was a blast from beginning to end, uh, working on that project to be top of top of the list it was fun from beginning to end you know and i i've i've heard a lot of stories about sam remy and they're all the same he is such a laid-back great guy to work with and he is yeah everybody everybody backs that message up where did you shoot the darkness of the road what was the location that was here in lancaster in california oh, okay because uh, you know it's the perfect location i mean for me personally growing up in a city one of my worst fears is my car breaking down in the middle of a desert, you know, a single lane highway, nobody <laughs> around for miles. And the location adds to the eerie and scary factor of the film. And then you have the great visual effects uh, with the lightning in the sky overhead. Uh, the cinematography in this film is really amazing. Uh, is Thank that, you. That's all you, or did you bring in a special DP to help you out? Who, how did you guys work together with the cinematography? Yeah, that's uh, John DeFacio, my DP. Uh, I've, I've worked with John for like the last 15 years or so. So we, we know, uh, I call John my friend uh, more than my DP. And uh, he's amazing. He's, he's a mad genius. He never, he never wants to do the same thing twice. He's always looking for new ways to tell the story with the camera. Uh, I remember that we have a shot on the movie where the camera is uh, sideways. I don't know if you remember, but yeah. you see the top of the car on the, on, on the right side of the screen. And, uh, and that was all John. And I remember one of the producers came to us and he's like, why are you guys putting the camera? I'm like, you're going to put it the right way, right? And we're like, no, it's <laughs> this is the way, this is the way we, we wanted it. This is the way we, we it wanted it for it. And it works, yeah. So I trust John uh, a thousand percent. Uh, and not, we actually, our only conversation that I can remember was the three colors on the movie. We, we From the beginning, we were, we were convinced that we wanted to only use blue, red, and yellow. Uh, again, trying to find that, unique mm -hmm. uh look for the movie and uh and that was it we after that we we, we did uh shot last we storyboarded a couple of scenes with because he needed special effects for the creatures and all that but uh but after that i knew that john was gonna was gonna uh hit it out out of the park you know so i wasn't i wasn't I trust him uh, completely. Since you brought up the creature, we're not going to give away any spoilers, but is that one of the elements that was very important to you to leave up to viewer interpretation? Yeah, absolutely. I left it as open as, as possible because uh, I didn't want to tell them what I think the creature is. You know, everybody can have their own 
interpretation of what it is. Now, when the film starts, uh, when, you know, it starts and then Siri ends up in this convenience store. She explains that she's driving to California for a fresh start and whatnot. And then we have that eerie, you know, in the beginning scene in that convenience store uh, with the two men in that store. Also, their roles are a little bit open to interpretation as well. Was that also your intent with them? Yeah. Um, I guess, this is, spoiler alert, I'm just going to tell you a quick, fun story. Okay. Uh, but it's going to spoil a little bit. Uh, Johnny Whitworth, the guy who plays the clerk on the... And uh, this is how much open to interpretation it was because I never thought of it this way. But uh, he he came to me after reading the script and uh, he really liked it and he wanted to be in the movie. He he comes to me and he's like, I know who the clerk is. And I'm like, oh, yeah? Who is he? He's Jesus Christ, right? And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> If you wanted him to be Jesus Christ, by all means, you know. So uh, it was again. It, it was sort of. It's, I wrote it uh, as just these two guys who help you go from one place to another. But I never thought or tried to make them specific. Specific characters. A uh, specific character. Very mm-hmm. well done. Now you said the movie released uh, the fourteenth, which is what, like two days ago. Two days ago, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's available on video on demand, correct? Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it wired like Amazon, Vudu, for people to rent or buy? So people I've seen it on Vudu, I've seen it on DirecTV, and I saw it on Google uh, Play. Movie. Play. Uh-huh. Yeah, Google Play. So, guys, the movie's called The Darkness of the Road. Uh, it's written and directed by Eduardo here. It's a great movie. Um, you know, it's not like a blood, guts, and gore type of horror movie. It's a movie that's going to keep you on the edge of your seat. It's going to keep you guessing. And as Eduardo said, it's going to really make you question a lot of things that you see throughout the film. Eduardo, you did a brilliant job with this film. I don't know Thank what you. I don't know what the hell was wrong with that screening crowd of 13, <laughs> 14 people. Uh, but whatever changes, little changes you said you made, Afterwards, it worked. It's a great film. Uh, Thank you. I have no doubt it's going to succeed. Thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your thoughts on what went into making this film. Are there any final thoughts you want to share before we go? Uh, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity, man. It's been fun. And uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and have a wonderful new year, man. We'll keep in touch. Absolutely. You too as well. Thank you to our audience for tuning in tonight. Thank you to Eduardo. On behalf of Eduardo Rodriguez and myself, stay safe and stay walking. Good night, everybody. Bye.